Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Among the many strange encounters in the world of the paranormal, there are often those that serve to be particularly baffling. These are the cases that hover out beyond our ability to really classify them or put a name to them. Are they ghosts, mysterious animals, aliens, or what? No answers are clear in such accounts, and they lurk out there in the periphery of the fringe. Among these bizarre accounts are tales from all over of what appear to be some sort of thin, pale beings, often hunched over, crouching, and crawling, that have come to be collectively known as pale crawlers, and which are every bit as creepy as you might imagine. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness Radio, where every week you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up this hour… There are roads on Long Island that are much more than a line between two points. Some roads contain legends that travel with you on your journey. But first, sightings of strange, pale creatures are being reported in California, and now, over two decades from the first sighting, we still don't know what the Fresno Nightcrawlers truly are. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to visit WeirdDarkness.com where you can follow me on social media, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, and more. That's WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Probably one of the most well-known cases of the Pale Crawler entities is that of what have come to be called the Fresno Nightcrawlers. The first account of these truly bizarre and unidentifiable creatures surfaced in the 1990s when a video came forward showing something very strange indeed lurking about in the area of Fresno, California. There was a family who were concerned about trespassers on their property as their dogs had begun to bark out into the darkness nearly every night, and this prompted them to install a security camera outside by their garage, facing the front lawn. The next morning, after they set up the camera, they were in for quite a shock, as there in the video was a pair of pale beings a few feet in height, with no discernible arms, and two long, spindly, almost stilt-like legs that appear to bend backwards. Interestingly, there seems to be some sort of fabric flapping around the legs, drawing many comparisons to a pair of disembodied walking pants. In the footage, the creatures smoothly and fluidly move across the front lawn and out of view. And that's that. The quality of the footage is, sadly, low, making it nearly impossible to discern any real details but the general shape and their odd way of moving were creepy enough to have the family contact the police. Before long, the media got a hold of the footage and the Fresno Nightcrawlers became a hot topic. Although thought by many to be a hoax, others say that this footage has captured something truly otherworldly, 
and the footage was subjected to a detailed analysis on the Sci-Fi Channel show Fact or Faked, which showed that the footage seemed to be genuine, and they were unable to reproduce the same results by intentionally faking the video. Following on the heels of this video was another, this time taken over in California's Yosemite National Park in March of 2011. In this case, surveillance cameras had been set up by park officials for the purpose of identifying some intruders who had been vandalizing an area of the park, and again, they seemed to have caught on tape something anything but human. Again, there was a pair of spindly white entities loping across the frame on a hillside, one seemingly much smaller than the other, and both with what appears to be some sort of webbing connected from the knees to the upper body. Although they appear to be very similar, it's unknown if the Fresno creatures and the ones from Yosemite are related or not, and there have been theories ranging from that this was all a hoax to that they are native spirits from lore, ghosts, or even aliens. No one really knows. Something similar to these entities was cited in January 2004 in a case documented by researcher Albert S. Rosales. The sighting allegedly happened in Manchester, Dearborn County, Indiana, when a young man was driving along a remote rural road in the area. As the witness rounded a bend, his headlights illuminated a tall, frail-looking pale being crouched over a puddle of water. As the witness passed the thing, he looked back and could make out that it moved in a disjointed, odd manner, and had, according to him, protruding joints that buckled out. As he watched the thing flickering in the red light cast by his taillights, the crouched, bone-white creature purportedly stood to a height of an estimated 6 feet 7 inches tall and began to walk about in a strange manner. Interestingly, as he watched, there was apparently another car that came along and seemed to swerve to avoid the thing before stopping. The witness would talk to the elderly couple in the car and they would confirm having seen the same thing, of which they said, it was no human being, it was no man. They were all so spooked that they decided to drive out of there in close procession together. Indiana has produced some other similarly odd reports as well. In one case, from the winter of 2016, the witness was out feeding goats on a farm in Davies County, Indiana at around 8 p.m., and when she finished, she started walking back. The witness would say of what happened next, "'After I had finished, I began to walk back. I had crossed one field and was about halfway through the narrow path when I started to hear rustling in the underbrush. All I had with me was a little flashlight that only shined about ten feet in front of me. I was almost to the end of the path when I spotted something. It was on all fours with a bony frame, elongated limbs, and pale skin. While the first part of that description sounds pretty generic, it did seem to have a long and highly flexible neck. Not long after I noticed it, it noticed me and bolted down the path. It ran almost scuttling into the second field. This field had a small hill in the center. This thing fled and disappeared over one side. I ran as fast as I could around the other side of the small hill and zigzagged back to my house where I quickly locked all of my doors. This thing was terrifying, but it seemed watchful more than anything. For now. We're not done with the Fresno Nightcrawlers. Up next, we get another report from Indiana when Weird Darkness returns. What makes someone kill? Not only innocent people, but sometimes the very people who loved and trusted them. What imagined wrongs could drive a deluded individual to seek revenge by taking another person's life? What lengths will people go to to get what they want? Murderous Minds, Volume 2, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines is the latest offering 
in a series that takes you inside the life of killers who committed cold-blooded murder for a glimpse at events that drove them to kill. Each tale is sordid, twisted, and worthy of newspaper headlines. By weaving a tale in which dark fantasies turned reality, this book invites you to see life from a perspective few ever witness – that of the killer. Paired with an in-depth account of each case, it will be a nightmarish journey to the darkest reaches of the mind of these real-life murderers. Murderous Minds, Volume 2 – Written by Ryan Becker Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. You can get Weird Darkness seven days a week through the Weird Darkness podcast, which you can find wherever you listen to podcasts, on YouTube or visit WeirdDarkness.com slash listen, and you can find a list of all the apps where you can listen to the show. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash listen. We're talking about the Fresno Nightcrawlers. Strange creatures indeed. But what are they? In another account from Indiana, documented in the National Cryptid Society database, we have a case from Michigan City, Indiana from 2012 in the middle of a lightning storm to add some atmosphere. The witness claims that she'd been staying at a beach house of a friend by Lake Michigan and that there'd been a lightning storm at the time. At around 2 a.m., some of them went outside to smoke and watch the lightning and that was when they noticed the beam of a flashlight scanning the tall grass by the shore, nearby as if searching for something. Thinking this to be a bit odd, the group of friends watched on and saw that the beam had captured an elongated, grayish, humanoid-looking creature stretched out on the beach. And the witness would say, "...the light sweeps by something in the grass, then it shines back onto it. What was illuminated was very strange." It appeared to be a naked guy crawling around on the grass. Although it had elongated arms and legs, it was moving kind of fast, crunched over. It only lasted a few seconds, long enough for all of us to see it. Then, after the thing ran off, the flashlight shines directly at us. It stayed pointing at us until it went out after a few seconds. Creepy. So we're all like, what the hell was that? We asked what each other saw, and we all seen a weird, stretched-out naked guy. The only explainable thing it could have possibly been was a drunk, gangly naked guy, but I don't think so, because it looked abnormally stretched. The light pointed at us, and it freaked everyone out. It was something strange. I can't say what the height of it was accurately, maybe around seven feet tall. My husband said it looked like something from a Marilyn Manson music video. I wanted to go down there. I wanted to see if we could find it, but no one would go and they were creeped out and wanted to go back inside. What on earth was the outlandish thing they saw? What was with that flashlight and why did it train itself on the observers of this surreal scene? Who knows? There have been a few sightings of something similar and equally baffling around the town of Effingham in the state of Illinois. One case file of the National Cryptid Society is dated as 2010 and concerns a witness only known as Jade. The witness was allegedly out one night headed for the supposedly haunted Casbar Cemetery out in the deep woods outside of Effingham along with two friends. When they were out in the countryside at around 1 a.m. in the morning, something very curious congealed out of the night, and the witness would say, I see something with yellow glowing eyes off the side of the country road just past the ditch in the headlights. Too short to be a deer, but too big to be a possum or a raccoon. As we get closer, it gets clearer, and I realize what I'm looking at is skinny, hairless, and gray. Human-like, but definitely not human. Crazy as hell looking thing. It was crouched down, its arms were incredibly long and looked like it could have been seven feet tall or bigger standing. 
I can feel myself get cold and my heart race and my hair stand on the back of my neck. Complete shock and terror set in and I can't make a sound. I'm just staring at it. By that time, we are right in front of it, passing it, and it just watches us drive by. It slinks into the dark. Then we're all just screaming, literally freaking the hell out. I was convinced it was a demon for months, but still doubted myself even seeing it, thinking my mind was playing tricks on me. We didn't even make it to the Casbar that night. We went straight home. I could not sleep that night. The witness went on to become convinced that what she had seen was a ghoul or an entity that lurks around feeding on the dead. She continues, They feed on the freshly dead and normally stay close to cemeteries to be close to food. They have been known to show themselves to humans when trying to get close to them to eat in times where fresh deceased bodies are scarce. I went to images of them and could only find illustrations, but they look exactly like what I saw that night. Everything I was reading was falling perfectly in place, lined up perfectly with my experience. I couldn't explain it away. Also in the state of Illinois is a case from the town of Rossville in 2010. The setting was at a cemetery and the time was just after sunset. The witness and a friend were walking down the main lane through the cemetery when something fairly weird scuttled out of the night. The witness would say, something came running from the gate and passed us on our left. My friend had laughed and asked if I had heard that, and I stopped walking and responded that no, but I had seen it. As the thing had passed between headstones, I caught a look. looked like a pale, emaciated humanoid that was running on all fours. It had no hair at all that I could see, and I did not get a look at the face. It was moving far faster than any person running on hands and feet should have been able to. My friends and I just stayed frozen there and waited for another friend to come and get us because we were too scared to move. It continued to circle us as we could hear it moving around. It never seemed threatening. If anything, it seemed curious, even scared of us. But who knows? I do know that it was not a coyote or a stray dog. I never saw the face, but I did see the head, and it did not have a muzzle. There was no tail either it definitely didn't have fur. It had pale, almost bluish skin, and I remember I could make out the ribs from where I was standing. Forgive me if this is a hot mess of a post. I was up all night researching this thing, and when I did fall asleep, I didn't sleep well. Other locations have had sightings as well, such as Ballard County in western Kentucky. As the witness was driving along the back roads on a gravel road one night at around 2 a.m., he says that he caught something in his headlights that startled him to the core. He said, I caught sight of something white and vaguely human crawling in the ditch. As we passed, I hit the brakes thinking it was a person who needed help. Are you crazy? Don't stop! Blake screamed. I looked in the mirror and I saw that it was standing up. Even though it was still in the ditch, it was as tall as the stop sign next to it. It took a step towards us and I hit the gas. As we drove away, I saw in the mirror that it dropped all fours and was crawling after us. I didn't start pulling away from it till I got up to about 40 miles per hour. No matter how close I was to it, I never got a good look at it. It was fuzzy, like it was constantly out of focus. I'm not sure why, but Something about it makes me think of it as male. Maybe the height? When it crawled, it moved like a lizard, hands and feet flat on the ground, elbows and knees up and out, body wiggling side to side. This happened when I was around 22. I'm 40 now, and I've never seen that thing again. I've taken many a midnight cruise along those narrow roads, but I've never had the nerve to go near that particular farm road again. Call me a chicken. I'll cluck happily. Such accounts seem to lie beyond any easy classification. Are we dealing here with some sort of cryptid? Ghosts? Aliens? Interdimensional interlopers or what? Or is it all just hoaxes and misinformation? These obviously seem to be far beyond normal reports of cryptids or ghostly phenomena, 
leaving us to merely ponder just what might be going on. Whatever the answers may be, these truly bizarre entities are not anything anyone would want to encounter slithering down a darkened road at night in the middle of nowhere, stumbling into your headlights. When Weird Darkness Returns, there are roads on Long Island that are much more than a line between two points. Some roads contain legends that travel with you on your journey. And in 1981, a cabin in the woods played host to a brutal family murder. We'll look into the still unsolved murders of the Ketty family. I've often joked about how, instead of an energy drink, I need a motivation drink. They just don't exist, or so I thought. I was told recently about Magic Mind. They wanted me to consider promoting their product, but I never endorse anything unless I've tried it and approve of it first. After taking Magic Mind with my morning routine every day, along with my vitamins and my coffee as always, in less than a week, I was feeling more focused, more alert, and surprisingly, more motivated. I'm spending more time on what's important and getting more accomplished when doing so. My mood is better, making each day less stressful. Magic Mind is doctors validated. It has over 200 scientific studies behind each of the ingredients, like cognizine cytosoline, it's the best nootropics on the market, the highest possible grade matcha, organically grown mushrooms from California, and more. Magic Mind uses nano-encapsulation technology. It helps your body to absorb the good stuff that much faster and more efficiently. So, I gave them my stamp of approval. I even signed up for a monthly subscription of 30 bottles before telling them I approved. And now Magic Mind is giving you, my weirdo family, a special deal. Up to 48% off your first subscription or 20% off one-time purchase with the code DARKNESS at checkout. Go to magicmind.com slash darkness and then use the code DARKNESS at checkout. In Huntington, Long Island, there is a small area south of Jericho Turnpike that holds more than its share of ghostly tales. Two roads in particular seem to harbor most of these ghostly wayfarers. Mount Misery Road and Sweet Hollow Road are less than a mile apart at their farthest points. Both are narrow, winding roads, pinned on both sides by thick woods. It used to be that you could turn your headlights off and drive in complete darkness, though due to accidents and land development, lights have been installed and the woodland has diminished somewhat. It still gives off a very eerie feeling, though, with the trees on all sides and overhead. A feeling where anything can happen. And anything does. Odd stories have been circulating about this particular area in Huntington, Long Island, since before the American Revolution. According to ufologist Bill Nell, at least two Native American tribes may have considered the area taboo. This is not how Mount Misery Road and Mount Misery proper got their names, though. Locals have called the area Mount Misery for centuries, but you'll never find it written that way on any map. It got its name because of its unfarmable land and the steep hills, since the area was not conducive to farming, it became a crossroads between farming communities and the difficult trek caused many a wagon wheel to snap. To many travelers, this was a miserable trip, and hence the name Misery. Since it became an area of high traffic, the Chichester family decided to build a small inn there called the Peace and Plenty Inn. Once the milling industry started up, the farmers had nowhere to go while they were waiting for the mill to finish, so the inn became a center of social life. The whereabouts of the inn are uncertain, but to this day there is a Chichester Road in that area. In the mid-1700s, a small mental asylum was built. 
Back in those days, the best cure for the mentally ill was to shut them up away from the other people so as not to upset the other members of society with their craziness. It suffices to say the treatment was not good, and there are accounts of screams and moans having been heard from the asylum. The story behind the fire that shut down the asylum is the beginning to these strange legends. Supposedly, one of the female patients was going through a bout of depression and managed to set her room on fire with herself inside. This burned down the entire hospital. It's said you can still see this patient at times with a white hospital gown and messy white hair wandering the roads. We believe this legend is tied to the other Lady in White legends that surround Mount Misery. She has many legends in one, merged by centuries of oral records and passed from generation to generation. Some say she was a patient of the hospital. Others claim she was a woman walking home from work who was killed by a car in the dark of night. She likes to jump in front of cars and some cars will even stall rather than run her over. For anyone familiar with the Long Island Mary's grave legends, you'll be surprised to note that Mount Misery too has its Mary and its own haunted cemetery. This is also intertwined with the Lady in White tales. All over Long Island, there are stories of a woman or child named Mary murdered in torturous ways and buried but not at rest. Legends say she was walking home and was killed on the roadside, and now she wanders these dark and lonely roads to protect other women from the same fate. Mary is also reported to be in white when she is sighted. Many drivers have noted seeing her both at the cemetery and along the roadside. She is not the only hiker along this haunted road. If you drive under the overpass, where the Northern State Parkway crosses Sweet Hollow Road, you might see many things. According to legend, some teens hung themselves from the bridge, and if you park by the bridge and flash the lights, they will appear. Also, a child was once hit by a car near the bridge and you can see him sitting in the road. Another woman, who is never seen, haunts the bridge. She was killed in a head-on collision in the 70s and now protects other drivers from the same fate. The road is very narrow and winding at that point, so it's very easy to believe a collision could occur. If you park under the bridge and put your car in neutral, she will push you back to safety, supposedly uphill. But that's not the most horrifying thing that might happen to you along this road. If a policeman pulls you over, check the back of his head. If he has no skull back there, you have just met one of Mount Misery's ghosts. If you see a man walking along the road in the rain, but when you stop to pick him up, he's gone, don't be alarmed. He may be a ghost. Some witnesses have reported seeing a disheveled man walking with a basket of heads supposedly from people who mysteriously disappeared in the area. Spectral humans are not the only spooks to look out for at Mount Misery, though. According to some tales, there is a creature called a hellhound also. It lurks in the trees by the road and will stare at you with fiery red eyes. Its fur is black as night, and some believe seeing the hound is an omen of imminent death. We had our own weird experience while traveling down Sweet Hollow Road once late at night. We noticed there was red paint on all of the yellow road signs reading, Help Me. Upon returning with cameras a few days later, the mysterious writing had vanished. Maybe road cleaners took it off, or maybe it was never even physically there. Just one more odd Mount Misery occurrence. Tales about the Mount Misery area have been passed on from person to person for over a hundred years, so it stands to reason that the tales will change and grow. Do demonic dogs wander the same roads as the eerie Lady in White? Only the road itself knows for sure. But whether you are a believer in the legends or not, it is indisputable that there are more oddities located in this small neighborhood than any other in Long Island. According to one resident, I live on Long Island and not far from where I live is Mount Misery Road. It's located in the town of Huntington between Plainview and Woodbury. The road has no street sign. The name is painted in white on a tree at the start of the road. 
The legend is that there was once a mental hospital there, and a mental patient started a fire in her room, killing herself and destroying the hospital. Ten years later, the hospital was rebuilt, but only a few months later, another fire broke out. Fearing another event, the town decided not to rebuild again and just use the land for housing. There are still some houses there, hidden deep in the woods, but very few. Mainly, there are just thick woods on both sides of the road. The legend is that if you find the right trail that'll take you to the spot where the main hospital once was, you'll see burning ghosts running and screaming. Another part to the legend is that Mount Misery Road is haunted by the mental patient who started the original fire there. She can be seen at certain times along the road. I've heard that she wears a hospital robe and has wild, white hair. I've also heard that she slowly dances along the side of that road. I've been there several times and I've seen nothing. It's a dark road surrounded by woods and just looks creepy. The one strange thing that I noticed is that at the end of the road there's a big tree stump lying across the road. It's meant to block off anyone from going into the woods beyond that point. There's a sign saying no one is allowed past that point. I wonder what could be in those woods beyond. Maybe it's the area where the ghosts can be seen? Who knows? And then another anonymous writer said, I grew up on Long Island, and though it's also an older part of the country, settled during Dutch times, many of the legends have been lost over time. However, there is one legend that I heard of when I was growing up and which was the story of Mount Misery Road, located in Huntington. The road starts in an affluent residential section and then continues into a large country park and ends. The road is said to be haunted and hostile to unwelcome visitors. Another oddity on the road is the ghost of Sally, which was an unfortunate individual who was killed when her car hit a tree. The story is that when the headlights of your car flash past this tree, you see a shadow sit up. Some say that it's just a trick of the car's lights. Some say that it's Sally. There are other stories of strange figures that walk alongside of the road and mysterious cars that chase you out of the area. Mount Misery Road was my favorite road to travel as a high school student, and each time somebody travels along that road there's always a new story to tell. Perhaps if you ever find yourself in the Huntington area at night, you too might travel along it and have a new story to add to the tale. When Weird Darkness returns, in 1981, a cabin in the woods played host to a brutal family murder. We'll look into the still unsolved murders of the Ketty killings. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. Do you have a true paranormal story that has happened to you or someone you know? You can share it by clicking on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com, and I might use it in a future episode. On the night of April 11, 1981, three people – a mother, her adolescent son, and the son's friend – were bludgeoned to death in a California cabin, all while children slept soundly in an adjacent room. A fourth victim, a 12-year-old daughter, vanished in the night, her remains found years later and miles away. The slayings, which would soon become known as the Keddie Cabin Murders, were chilling enough. 
Yet the case is made all the more unsettling by the fact that it remains unsolved nearly four decades later, leading some to suspect a police cover-up. Glenna Sharp, who went by the name Sue, had been renting Cabin 28 in the tiny community of Keddie, California since November of 1980. She lived there with her five children. The family had moved from Connecticut after Sue separated from her husband James. Newly alone and five children to raise, Sue chose Ketty in part because her brother Don lived nearby. Finding a new support system would be important as she restarted her life, even if it meant renting a cabin in a run-down resort in a rural area. Five months later, the Sharps had found a semblance of community in their new home, with the children having made friends among the other residents of the Kitty Cabins. On the night of the murders, Sue was at home while her two youngest sons, Rick and Greg, and their friend Justin Smart, played in an adjacent room. Tina Sue's youngest daughter returned home around 10 o'clock after an evening of watching television with the neighbors in Cabin 27. Sue's oldest son John had spent the day in the town of Quincy with his friend Dana Wingate. The pair was last seen walking along State Route 70. They returned home to Cabin 28 later that night, presumably retiring to John's basement bedroom. Whether they entered the home with the murders actively in progress or became aware of intruders after hearing a disturbance upstairs is unknown. In either case, John and Dana would not survive the night. The following morning, Sue's oldest daughter Sheila came home after a night spent with friends. Upon entering, she discovered three bodies on the living room floor of Cabin 28. Sue, John, and Dana's bodies had been left, sprawled across the floor. A search of the premises revealed the trio of younger boys still in their room, alive and unharmed. With the help of neighbors, Sheila removed the three children. The final member of the Sharp family, 12-year-old daughter Tina, was nowhere to be found. The three victims found in the cabin had met a violent end. Their bodies were bound with medical tape and appliance wire. They had been stabbed, bludgeoned, and strangled to death. Examinations revealed that the victims suffered blows from at least two different hammers of varying sizes, and Sue and Jean had been stabbed repeatedly. Sue had also been bludgeoned with a Daisy Powerline 880 rifle, while Dana Wingate was strangled to death by hand. Sue was discovered lying on her side by the living room couch and was nude from the waist down. She had also been gagged with a blue bandana and her own panties. They had been secured on her face with medical tape. Her wrists and ankles were also bound with medical tape and two rounds of electrical wire. There was also wire that tied her ankles together. Her ankles and wrists were tied so tightly that her legs and knees were drawn toward each other. She'd been covered with a blanket and sheet that belonged to Tina. Johnny's hands were placed on his abdomen and taped tightly at the wrists with medical tape. His ankles were wrapped twice and tightly knotted with an extension cord. Dana had also been bound with medical tape. Although the Sharps cabin did not show any indication of forced entry, detectives were able to recover an unidentified fingerprint from a handrail that led to the cabin's back door. Detectives also discovered that the telephone had been left off the hook and the lights had been shut off with all the drapes fully closed. Various weapons were found at the scene, including a table knife, a butcher knife, and a bloody hammer. Other weapons, including the Daisy rifle, were not recovered. Some evidence, such as a second bloody knife, turned up in a trash bin behind the Keddie General Store. In interviews, Justin Smart told detectives that he had dreamt details of the murder only to later confirm that he had actually witnessed it. Under hypnosis, Justin claimed that he had seen Sue with two men, one with a mustache and long hair, and one clean-shaven with short hair. John and Dana then entered the home and began arguing with the men. The argument became violent. The three were still alive when Tina entered the room. One of the men took her out the back door before coming back to kill Sue, John, and Dana. Composite sketches were made based on Justin's descriptions, but never led to any identification. In April of 1984, 
three years after the slayings occurred, part of a skull was found 29 miles away near Camp 18 in neighboring Butte County. The discovery prompted a thorough examination of the area, revealing a jawbone and several other bones. The fragments were eventually determined to belong to young Tina. The discovery of Tina's remains compounded a case already steeped in mystery. Why was the body of Tina Sharp found so far away from Cabin 28? How could a murder with so much physical evidence remain unsolved? The abundance of loose threads, in conjunction with what appeared to be a substandard investigation, have prompted some to suspect a police cover-up. In 2004, Cabin 28 was demolished, among with several other condemned buildings on the ground. Some theorists believe that mob, gang, or police connections were responsible for the bungling of the case and the destruction of the property, but without the complete facts. It's hard to know whether incompetence, conspiracy, or mere bad luck have left the Ketty murders unsolved. In 2008, Marilyn Smart, the mother of Justin, claimed in a documentary on the murders that she suspected her husband Martin Smart and his friend Bo Boudet were responsible for the murders of Sue, John, Dana, and Tina. In the same documentary, Sheriff Doug Thomas stated that Martin had successfully passed a polygraph examination about the murders. Of course, the use of polygraphs in criminal cases has become increasingly discounted in recent years. It was later confirmed that Martin was close with the sheriff of Plumas County, despite the fact that both Martin and Bo had criminal records. In November 2016, the true crime show People Magazine Investigates released an episode dedicated to re-examining the Keddie Cabin murders. Several new pieces of evidence and information came to light, which may finally help crack this cold case. First, though the primary suspects in the slayings, Marty Smart and Bo Boubed, are now deceased, new details continue to emerge that suggest their culpability. According to People Magazine, Smart's anger toward Sue Sharp for interfering in his marriage was a viable motive for the killings. After the murders, he wrote a letter to his wife Marilyn, which was only discovered after the case was reopened in 2013. The letter said, I've paid the price of your love, and now that I've bought it with four people's lives, you tell me we are through? Great, what else do you want? Though Marilyn claims she never received the letter and was only made aware of it after the murders by the authorities, she confirmed that it was in Smart's handwriting. Even more potentially incriminating is a therapist in Reno, Nevada, to whom Smart allegedly confessed the murders. Another important piece of new evidence is a hammer, discovered by a man with a metal detector in a pond near the cabins. It matches the description of a hammer that Marty Smart claimed to have misplaced. It's currently being tested for DNA evidence. The final bizarre piece to the puzzle? A copy of a 911 recording, found at the bottom of a Ketty murder case file box. The call dates back to 1984, in the weeks after the skull fragments that would later be confirmed to belong to Tina Sharp were first discovered in Butte County. The anonymous caller identified the remains as Tina's and then hung up. Chillingly, records indicate that this caller knew the remains belonged to Tina before investigators confirmed the fact with dental records. In April 2018, Plumas County Special Investigator Mike Gamberg stated that DNA evidence recovered from a piece of tape at the crime scene matched that of a known living suspect. Mike Gamberg, who leads the current investigation, is baffled by these inconsistencies. It's not what was done, he told the Sacramento Bee in reference to the many flaws of the original investigation, it's what wasn't done. Though the original inquiry into the Ketty murders was sadly lacking, there is now new hope that authorities today might be able to discover the truth once and for all. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please tell somebody about it who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. And tell them where they can listen to the show so they can tune in next weekend. 
If you missed any part of tonight's show, or if you'd like to hear it again, you can subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app by searching for Weird Darkness. By doing that, you'll get a copy of tonight's show, plus daily podcast episodes that come out seven days per week. Visit WeirdDarkness.com and you can also follow me on social media. Drop me an email, send me your own true paranormal story, listen to other podcasts that I host, and more. All stories used tonight are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes, which I have already posted at WeirdDarkness.com. Freaky Reports of Pale Crawlers was written by Brent Swanser. Mountain Misery and Sweet Hollow Road is by Arthur Criscione. The Unsolved Kenny Killings is by Oren Gray. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Romans 8 verses 38 and 39. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And a final thought. Being rejected from something good just means you are being pointed towards something better. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching and our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. The doppelganger is someone who looks almost identical to someone else, even though they are not related to that person. It's eerie to come across someone with practically the same features and characteristics as yourself or another person you know, and doppelgangers are often seen as spooky. True doppelganger stories can be truly horrifying and often include interesting details about how people tried to interact with their lookalikes. With over 7.5 billion humans in the world, it shouldn't come as a surprise that there are plenty of people who look uncannily similar to each other. But what about someone who is unrelated to you but is your exact duplicate? Meeting a doppelganger can be a surreal experience, especially if they suddenly disappear without a trace. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness Radio, where every week you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up this hour… Violence, mayhem, even rape, horrifying atrocities committed by the most evil of human beings but in one case, in Culver City, California, it wasn't a man who engaged in these obscenities, but specters of the paranormal. We'll delve into some out-of-body experience stories directly from those who lived through them, and they might change your opinion about the afterlife. But first, we'll look at true encounters from Redditors who claim to have come across doppelgangers, their exact duplicates or duplicates of those they love. 
and it's almost always a disturbing experience. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to visit WeirdDarkness.com where you can follow me on social media, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, and more. That's WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Late at night, I usually go to the bathroom multiple times, but for the past four days, every time I go to leave, I can see myself still standing in the mirror from the corner of my eye. It's like the other me is watching me leave the bathroom. It terrifies me to the point where I almost run out without looking directly at the mirror. I never told my husband about it because I didn't want to acknowledge it out loud. Earlier today, I took a nap in our bed while he sat in the chair next to it watching TV. When I woke up, he told me that he had seen me sit up and crawl backwards to the edge of the bed and stand up in front of our bedroom door from the corner of his eye. He thought it was weird that I got up like that because I'm in the last month of my pregnancy and I can't really move so well without it hurting. So he tried talking to me. When I didn't answer, he looked at the door to find me not there, still sleeping in bed. I got really creeped out and I finally told him about what I was seeing in the bathroom. He thought it was creepy as well, but he didn't really want to talk about it anymore because he thinks that it'll give whatever it is power or energy. I have no idea what it wants or why we both have seen it. I remember one Sunday morning, my brother and I were watching Card Captor Secura on TV and someone knocked on the door. We lived in an apartment that was empty. The owner hadn't rented the second floor, it was a two-bedroom apartment a kitchen and a bathroom by the door. A small apartment, but with a big window that faces out the door. So when I heard someone knock, I checked the window and saw my father, so I thought. I was going to the door to open it. When I was going to unlock the door, my mother pulls me away and screams at me to not open the door because I didn't know who it was. I told her I saw my dad. She freaked out, going to the window and checking, and then checking the peephole. She started to get terrified and she said to go to the farthest room in the apartment and not to come out. She went and woke up my dad. My dad got up angry and confused. We told him what we saw and the man was still knocking on the door. My dad screamed, who is it? No answer. He said that he was going to call the cops, the regular threats, you know, but nothing. We saw while my dad was busy screaming at him that he was just standing still in front of the door. So my mom took us to the farthest room from the door while my dad got ready to open the door with a metal bat. Once he did, the man was gone. My dad goes out looking everywhere around the apartment. The apartment door was a heavy metal door and always was heard when somebody came in and out, but we heard nothing that morning, nor nothing when my dad opened the door. We heard no footsteps either. But my brother, my mother, and I, we saw that man, and he looked exactly like my father. I remember one time I was talking to my dad in a hallway of my house once. I don't really remember what it was about. We both saw my mom clearly walk past us and into her room, shutting the door. I walked back out into the living room, and my mom was still on the couch, albeit asleep. I looked back at my dad, and he looked at me. We were both terrified. We both crept over to their bedroom and looked at the closed door. Neither of us went inside. We were too freaked out. I'm pretty sure my dad slept on the floor that night. When I was nine, I stayed home sick from school. I distinctly remember that I wasn't actually sick, simply playing hooky to avoid the mean kids as I did that a lot around that age. I awoke from a nap, turned on the TV in our living room, and scrolled through some channels when my mother suddenly leaned over the bar and stared at me without saying anything. I'd been awake for a few minutes at this point, so I can't rightly blame sleep paralysis for all of this. 
Now, whatever this thing was, it was entirely identical to my actual mother. It sounds weird to describe, but it's as if the only difference was that this thing pretending to be my mom had never felt a single emotion in its life. It was really unsettling. It beckoned me, and I attempted to talk to her as I would my mother. She kept beckoning, refusing to answer, and that's when I sensed something horribly wrong. The whole scenario felt disgustingly familiar, but I'll get into that later. Naturally, I started screaming at this thing to answer me. It just kept beckoning. I bolted, running out of the room and into the yard yelling for help. My mother, the real one, had been working in the yard and came rushing over. I told her what I had just seen and she soothed me with some easy explanations that, oh, it must have been a fever dream. But thankfully, she did stay by my side the rest of the afternoon as I was a nervous wreck. More real creepy encounters with doppelgangers when Weird Darkness returns. Have you had your own doppelganger experience? If so, tell me about it. You can tell your true paranormal story by clicking on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com. I might use it in a future episode. That's WeirdDarkness.com, and then click on Tell Your Story. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Welcome back to Weird Darkness, I'm Darren Marlar. If you'd like to display your dark weirdness wherever you go, you can find Weird Darkness t-shirts, trucker caps and dad hats, school supplies, kids' clothes, coffee mugs, and a whole lot more in the Weird Darkness store, with dozens of designs to choose from and a variety of colors to match whatever style grabs your weirdo imagination. You can grab some weirdo merchandise for yourself or maybe as a gift for the weirdo in your life by clicking on Store at WeirdDarkness.com. We continue now with true stories of real and creepy doppelgangers. When I was about 16 or 17, I was really heavy into doing a Ouija board. Other stuff happened, but the doppelgangers were definitely the worst. The first one was my mom. I heard her come in and my best friend was with me. She and I walked down to greet her, and she looked like a younger version of my mom and was carrying groceries, so I tried calling out to her, but she didn't respond and walked into my brother's room. And then I got a sick feeling. I called out to her, but she didn't respond still, so I followed her up. She was not there. When I walked back down, my real mom had come in and didn't know what was going on. She was also wearing a different outfit. The next one was my brother. My mom was talking to him on the phone, and he said that he was on his way home. As soon as he hung up, my brother walked in the door. He talked to us for a little. Mom wanted him to take out the garbage or something, and then walked to the bathroom. He'd been in the bathroom for like 15 minutes, and, and then I got a sick feeling again. I asked if he had fallen in or something, and then my real brother walked in the front door. We were freaked out. My mom checked on him all night to make sure he was okay. Both times, 
These doppelgangers had darker eyes, and it felt sort of like a dream, but I was definitely awake, and other people witnessed it. Both times that my family experienced doppelgangers, the doppelgangers refused to respond when spoken to. The first was my sister's doppelganger, whom my brother told to go downstairs for lunch. She did not answer. When my brother walked downstairs, he instantly saw my actual sister wearing a different shirt. She couldn't have passed by my brother so quickly because the staircase led directly to our dining area. The second was my own doppelganger, who stood at my door at 12 p.m., mute, staring at my sister, who was using the computer. I wasn't actually home until 4 p.m. later that day after school. My sister didn't know that, though, until she asked me why I was just staring at her without emotion around noon. I woke up one morning to my dad going to the kitchen and stopping by to say, hey, wake up! And then I took my phone and started watching YouTube. I was awake for sure. Later, my mom was walking to the kitchen and did the same thing my dad had done. And then I get out of my bed and I see that my parents are still in their room. I asked them if they asked me to wake up while walking to the kitchen and they said no. I don't know what it was. Can somebody please explain this? We had problems with doppelgangers at a fast food joint that I worked at. I had two separate sightings myself. First, my GM comes by to tell me, in drive through and the register person to clean the lobby, then goes to the restroom. So he and I come up with a plan and wait for her to come out. We see her walk out of the restroom, walk by us, and walk into the lobby. We go to catch her, and no one there. We turn around, and she's walking out of the bathroom. We tell her what we just saw, but she doesn't believe us. Second, manager and I are in the prep area. One of the girls is working up front, walks back and right into the walk-in cooler. About five minutes of waiting, the manager asks me to go check on her. I open the walk-in door. There is no one in there. As I'm trying to explain this to my manager, the girl in question walks into the prep area from the front. Needless to say, the manager believed me this time, because she saw it as well, and she finally believed what had happened in that first sighting. The first one was my husband. I turned into the hallway and saw him there, walking away from me and towards the bedroom at the opposite end. I called to him, but he didn't respond. As soon as he entered the bedroom, he turned to the left. There's just a wall there, not even any windows. I followed him into the bedroom, but there was no one there. My husband had been upstairs the entire time. The second time was my dad. He was unloading some things from his truck and was going to bring them to the back door, which opens into the kitchen. I was in the kitchen and heard a noise at the door. Through the window, in the door, I saw my dad bending over as though he was bending down to untie his shoes. I ran to the door and opened it, but there was no one there. My dad was still at his truck. Both times it's been a family member. Both times I haven't seen their faces. Neither event felt wrong in any way or sinister. The movements that the figures made were exactly the movements my dad or husband would have made. This happened to me when I was living at my sister's house in college. My room was in the basement and the bathroom was on the second floor. One morning, she saw me in the hallway mirror behind her walking toward the bathroom in the same clothes I was wearing. She said good morning, but I didn't even look like I noticed. I then came upstairs about five minutes later and she seemed puzzled, thinking I was already upstairs. Freaked her out. My wife said she saw me in the kitchen doing something while I was actually at work at the time. She initially thought I'd come home from work and was worried, and then the figure of me apparently vanished, which was naturally even more upsetting. No other occurrences before or since. When I was in middle school, I was at a friend's apartment. She lived there with her mom. Her mom was cool and let us party there, and she was always at work for long, late hours. There was a group of us there, maybe six people or so. Everyone was in the living room except for this couple who were in the mom's bedroom with the door closed and lights off. We all got pretty baked. I just made myself a snack and was walking to my friend's bedroom, which was right past the mom's room where the couple was. As I walked past the mom's bedroom door, 
Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the door opening from the inside, and a partial face or head that looked identical to my friend's mom, who wasn't at home. Well, I didn't think anything of it since there were so many people in the small apartment, and I kept walking and sat in my friend's room. A minute later, the girl who'd been screwing around in that bedroom came out and yelled at me and asked me why I'd kicked the door open. I told her I saw somebody come out of there, and she was adamant that I had walked by and kicked the door open. The more I thought about it, the weirder it was. I thought she was messing with me at first, but the person I saw didn't look like anyone who was there at the time. It looked so much like the mom of the house. If it were her, it would have meant that she had somehow snuck back into the apartment after being gone for hours, hidden in her room in the dark for over an hour while this couple was messing around on her bed, and then she would have had to have discreetly left the bedroom and passed the living room, full of people to get out the door. Hmm. This is just a little story that's probably not worth telling, but a couple of friends got a kick out of it. I let my dog out at midnight one night, left the door ajar for him to come back in, and then went about making some soup and something to drink. After a couple of minutes, I heard his distinctive two long toenails trotting back in on the wood flooring. I lock up the door and return to my meal. And then I hear my dog barking from outside. Any dog owner knows that there is no mistake in those toenails, so I was a little shocked that he was somehow back outside. So what had come in? So I'd just gotten real baked at my friend's apartment. Walking home in broad daylight down the sidewalk ahead of me, I see two young girls, instantly recognizable as Mormon missionaries. They get about 50 feet away from me, and one of them waves and calls me by name. We meet, and one of the girls gives a friendly hello, acts like she knows me. Bear in mind, I'm pretty stoned, so I'm trying to figure out if I do know her from somewhere, but she catches on that I don't recognize her, and she acts kind of offended, so she reminds me that we had some big, long conversation on her friend's porch on such-and-such such street just a few days prior. Now, at this point in my life, I smoked a lot of weed, but I never drank or did anything else, and going to random parties and charming pretty young blondes was completely off the menu. I was already half in love from the moment she smiled at me. I don't think I would have forgotten this long, engrossing conversation we apparently had had. Now, her expression I remember as I stumbled through this conversation. At first, she thought I was joking, and then she thought I was being mean, and then she kind of looked just as confused as I was. So I suggest, maybe it was my brother you met? She looks at me skeptically. Not unless he's your identical twin. Well, me and my brother, we look like brothers, but you would never confuse us for one another. So we awkwardly, confusedly part ways. I don't remember the other girl ever saying anything. And then it dawns on my dumb stoned brain. She knew my name. I turn around. They're a few hundred feet away. I yell, wait, how did you know my name? But they don't hear me, and I foolishly couldn't muster the courage to run to catch up with them. That bugged me for weeks. I wanted to know what we had talked about. When Weird Darkness returns, we'll look at a handful of out-of-body experience stories directly from those who lived through them, and they might change your opinion of the afterlife. But first, violence, mayhem, even rape. Horrifying atrocities committed by the most evil of human beings. But in one case, in Culver City, California, it wasn't a man who engaged in these obscenities, but specters of the paranormal. That story is up next. The first letter seemed harmless enough, possibly even just the result of a mistaken delivery. The second one drew concern, and paired with the unexplained visions of something darkly unsettling, Sam Morris finally caves. The everyman safe world he lives in is about to take a drastic and dark turn. He quickly falls into a world of insanity, the morbid and the macabre he's drawn into a darkness that is just as deadly as it is mysterious. A darkness that dwells in a house that could only be conjured up by a mad brain. 
It is a house that calls you. A house that haunts you with its ghosts. They'll scratch and claw through your fragile hide, bringing madness bubbling to the surface. Come see the ghosts for yourself. If you dare. Weird Darkness Publishing presents Of a Mad Brain by Scott Donnelly. Now available on paperback, ebook, and audiobook versions through Amazon and WeirdDarkness.com. The story of one of the most frightening and violent hauntings of all time starts in 1974 with a single mother by the name of Doris Bither, who lived in Culver City, California with her four children. The family had moved here from Santa Monica in order to try and start a new life after a string of abusive relationships that Doris had been in and to try and escape her demon of alcoholism. It was a rough time of things as Doris had barely enough to raise her four children, all born of different fathers, and they were a broken family living in dirt-poor conditions. But things would soon get worse still, when something decidedly dark and paranormal came calling. It started rather creepily enough, with an elderly woman who came over one day shortly after they moved in to tell Doris out of the blue that she had once lived in the home and that it was evil before wandering off to never be seen again. So far, so eerie, but it would prove to be almost prophetic. Not long after this, there would be instances of classic poltergeist activity, such as lights turning on and off, objects moving on their own, and anomalous noises, all of which were witnessed by all of the family members. Then, things graduated to the more frightening when apparitions would start appearing. At first it was just glimpses, a shadow figure moving across the living room here, a movement in the periphery of the vision there, but it got steadily more intense, and even neighbors began seeing these things around the house. The figures that were seen started to take shape, appearing as fog-like humanoid shapes that would move about or merely sit in the corner and simply watch. In an interview with Ghost Theory, Doris's middle son, Brian Harris, would describe them like this. It was never clear. When they would make themselves known, it was always like a fog, like a human but not quite. It was like a sculpture, like a chiseled body, not a full figure, but at times we could see some of it. At times it would be annoying. We'd be watching television and these things would walk by, like nothing. We were so used to the poltergeist that we just got to a point where we wouldn't even care. It became increasingly clear that there were more than one entity as well, either three or four of them, depending on who you ask, although Harris said that there were four. This spooky paranormal activity, although at first scary but mostly harmless, would not stay that way for long, soon becoming increasingly terrifying. Not content to just mill about and cause mischief, the entities began to lash out at the family, pushing, shoving, hitting, and even clawing or biting them, and this would happen at all hours, even in the middle of the daytime. Harris would say, We all experienced some form of attack. There was the pushing, biting, and scratching being done to us. There were about four entities in the home, and they made themselves known by appearing all the time. I think it took a lot of energy for them to do that. It was as if they, the four entities, showed themselves whenever they felt like. Although he said there were four of the specters, Doris herself would later claim that there were only three. But the true number was too many. Even more terrifying still was the entities that began to actively target Doris most vehemently, and it went from simple pushes, scratches, and bites to full-on assault, with the ghosts even allegedly holding her down and raping her with abandon. 
This would often happen in the next room while the terrified children listened to the bangs, thuds, and their mother's desperate screaming as they cowered in the shadows. But it also sometimes happened right in front of their eyes, and Harris has described these spectral attacks. The whole rape thing was real, he said. My room was right next door to my mother's. I would hear the attacks happening, things being thrown, her screaming. Then she would come out of the bedroom and have all these bruises on her legs, her inner thighs. There were times where we would see it happen in front of us. It was like if a man was standing in front of my mother and would start to beat her. Imagine a woman being beaten. You could see her being picked up and thrown around. Sounds, slaps, but there was no one there to actually do it. We all felt it too, pulling, biting, and scratching. We were all attacked. These vicious attacks and sexual assaults went on unabated, with the apparitions appearing without warning practically every day and night, and it got to the point where the family was desperate for anyone to help them. The biggest of the entities even gained a creepy nickname for himself, Mr. Who's It? Doris took it upon herself to approach paranormal investigators and parapsychologists Kerry Gaynor and Dr. Barry Taff, who were intrigued by her harrowing tale to say the least, and went about arranging a full investigation into the claims. They would not be disappointed. The team moved in for their investigation August 22, 1974, thinking at first that there would not be much to this all other than a seriously disturbed young woman. The first thing they did was take a look at the myriad bruises, scratches, and scars that she had all over her body, especially along her inner thighs, allegedly inflicted by the entities and which proved to be far more savage and severe than they had expected. She gave them additional information on the attacks by saying that there were three of them, despite her son's claim that there were four, and that the two smaller entities would hold her down while the bigger one raped her. Intrigued but not yet sold, the investigators set up their equipment in an effort to gather any evidence at all of a haunting. When this was done, they had Doris go into one of the rooms where the most activity had been occurring and told her to start yelling and cursing at the unseen entities, trying to draw them out. Almost immediately, there was intense orb activity captured on the equipment, with spots of light flitting all over the place like angry bees. After this, Doris was seen to be enveloped by greenish mist, followed by the materialization of what appeared to be the upper torso of a man, which hovered there in the mist and was apparently so terrifying that one of the investigators fainted. This torso could not be captured on the equipment, but there is a photograph of Doris with a strange arc of light appearing over her. This sort of intense paranormal activity would continue virtually unabated for the next several months of the investigation, including apparitions, mysterious lights, temperature drops, horrific mystery odors, and moving objects. It was even noticed that the investigators' presence actually seemed to anger and irritate the entities, and it was also found that playing music by the metal group Black Sabbath also seemed to cause an uptick in activity making it all stronger, but then it suddenly started winding down and stopping altogether for no discernible reason. In later years, Doris would move her and her family to other places on several occasions, but according to her, each time the entities would follow her wherever she went, although somewhat weaker than they had been. She would even claim at one point that she had been impregnated by one of the spirits, Although her case had become quite well known at the time, Doris herself would drop off the radar for years before finally succumbing to cardiac arrest in 1995, leaving us no further along as to what happened to her than when these supernatural forces first targeted her. What exactly happened to this poor woman and her family? What sort of spirits or entities targeted them and why? That would depend a lot on who you ask but according to Taff himself, it has nothing at all to do with ghosts or spirits as we imagine them. Taff is convinced that the phenomena were caused by the subconscious human mind lashing out to affect the world around it through psychokinesis, 
the ability to move objects with the mind. In his theory, this is all the result of various factors coming together to cause the mind of a victim to reach out to wreak havoc on the outside world, most often without their awareness that they're even doing so. So insistent is he that this is the case and that such hauntings are caused by the projections of living beings rather than demons or the ghosts of the dead that he has expressed disdain for these paranormal ideas, saying, I don't for one second believe this is the work of dead people throwing living people around, as there are no academic credentials required for anyone to go out and investigate the paranormal. Every New Age groupie is out there looking for demons, emulating the garbage they've seen on cable TV paranormal shows. To fully comprehend the possibility that a living person's subconscious mind can involuntarily generate such power as to manifest luminous anomalies, apparitions, and macroscopic psychokinetic events is for me far more compelling than if a discarnate intelligence was responsible. The evidence and collected data suggests these effects are the result of what's called recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis RSPK. There's two types of psychokinesis moving physical objects around with physical means. There's microscopic, which works on a very small scale, things like affecting random number generators, random event generators, and moving subatomic particles around. It's usually electrostatic-based. Fatigue in the individual is shown, as it's done on a conscious level. And then there is macroscopic, what we call poltergeist, and that is a whole different ball of wax. We're talking about the ability of moving very massive objects, hundreds of pounds, easily. It's done on a subconscious level as there is no fatigue seen in the person at the core of it. Like the microscopic type, it's believed that the phenomena are generated by a living human agency. Taff has used this explanation to explain a wide range of what are traditionally considered to be paranormal phenomena, which he has compiled into a book called Aliens Above, Ghosts Below, Explorations of the Unknown which takes the approach of trying to explain all of these disparate phenomena with possible real-world rational solutions. Others disagree and say that this was some sort of demonic presence, a trio of ghosts up to no good, or just the delusions of a fractured mind. It has never been solved, regardless. Whatever the case is remains to be seen, but in the meantime, the Doris Bithers story has gone on to become one of the most frightening and controversial accounts of a haunting on record. So famous and noteworthy is this mysterious case that it was made into a 1983 Hollywood film based on these events, called The Entity, starring Barbara Hershey, directed by Sidney J. Fury, and which is loosely based on the real events. What was it that terrorized this family so violently? We may never know for sure. Up next, we'll look at a handful of -of out-of-body experience stories directly from those who lived through them. They might change your opinion about the afterlife. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird dark roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. If you or somebody you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, 
There's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anybody to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or a counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, even help for those in a domestic abuse situation. These resources and more are always there when you or somebody you love needs them on the Hope of the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash hope. You've probably heard of the stories, or seen it in the movies. People slip out of their bodies for a split second, and their outlook on life is totally changed. From premonitions about death to soaring high above the ground, these experiences shook their beholders to the core, and they might have the same effect on you. After heart surgery 10 years ago, Michael, age 35, specifically remembers floating above his hospital bed. Looking down, he saw the nurses frantically moving around him, calling to grab the paddles. Despite the urgency in the room around him, though, Michael reports feeling exceptionally calm the entire time. He just floated above, watching. Then, suddenly, it ended. He woke up in the hospital bed with his dad and girlfriend sitting beside him. When he relayed the experience to a nurse later, she laughed and said this was a common experience for cardiac patients who flatline. Michael never considered himself a religious man, but after this experience, he knows there is something in the universe much larger than any of us. When Margaret, now 38, was a young girl, she remembers repeatedly being able to step away from her body and fly away shortly after falling asleep. The first few times it happened, she thought it was a dream. She could move through walls without touching them and was actually able to watch her parents in real time. It was then she knew it was no dream. The only spooky thing was her dog. A normally calm and quiet animal, her dog would whine whenever Margaret emerged from her body, immediately causing her to return. She stopped having out-of-body experiences after her parents divorced during her freshman year in high school, and it hasn't happened since. Jason, now 28, has experienced stepping out of his body more than once and was able to induce it himself a few times while in deep meditation by visualizing himself as hovering over his body. He describes slipping out of your body like being attached to a spider's thread. You're always connected but aware of a separation. He became interested in meditation because of previous sleep-induced out-of-body experiences, or OBEs, he wanted to determine if those experiences were real or just something in his head. Over time, he has become convinced that they are indeed real. He has since tried to understand what exactly an OBE is and why they occur, but after speaking with various meditation teachers, none have offered answers that satisfy him. Maybe it's just something that we'll never be able to understand. 36-year-old Eugene's case is another dealing with meditation. He started the practice to help manage his stress, but found more than he was expecting. Once, a man from Nepal came to his meditation center to present a lecture on mindfulness. He seemed aware of the room's collected skepticism in his unconventional ways, so he handed out post-it notes to five members present and told them to write a number between one and a hundred. They were then instructed to put the paper in their pockets, then lay them face up on the floor after he had entered an out-of-body status and was gone. He claimed that when he returned to his body, he'd be able to tell them what numbers were on the papers. The room sat in 30 minutes of silence before he eventually sat up and correctly stated all five numbers. To this day, Eugene has no explanation for how this was done. Was it truly an out-of-body experience, or was it simply some kind of crafty magic trick? It was a very quiet day, and 25-year-old Sarah 
recalls that she felt particularly relaxed. Her eyes were closed. She was outside and listening to the surrounding noise. As she lay there, she felt like she was slowly moving up, as though she was standing or being lifted, though she was confident this was not the case. She was suddenly overwhelmed by the sense of being in two places at once, floating in the air and still lying on the ground below. Even stranger, she could see the world around her despite her eyes being closed. It was disorienting, so she threw out her arms to try and catch herself and emerged from this strange state. It hasn't happened again since. When Anna was 14 years old, she had a dream that she was standing in her grandparents' kitchen and saw her grandmother telling her grandfather she wasn't feeling well. He started crying, and her grandmother tried to comfort him. Anna woke in tears herself, feeling an enormous sense of grief, but blew off the experience as just a really bad dream. A couple days later, her mother got a phone call from her grandfather, saying that her grandmother had suffered a massive heart attack in the kitchen and died. Three days after the call, Anna's family went to the Gulf Coast of Alabama, where her grandparents had moved a year earlier. She had never been before, nor seen any pictures, but when she entered the kitchen, it was the exact same as she had seen in her dream. She didn't tell her mother about this until she was nearly 30, and her mother wasn't surprised. She said Anna had always been close with her grandfather and thought she probably went to him because he was sad. Anna believes she somehow ventured into the future to her grandparents' house the moment her grandmother died. It made her realize that we are truly connected to people we love in a way that is far beyond physical. Finally, Brian, now 30, was seven when he was climbing a tall tree in his backyard and took a fall. He landed flat on his back, hitting his head on a root. However, the next thing he knew, he was getting up off the ground and dusting off his clothes. His mother ran from the house, yelling for his dad. Brian was ready to tell her that he was okay when he looked down and saw another him still lying unconscious on the ground. From a distance, he watched his mom kneel over his body and gently pat his face. He woke with her leaning over him. To this day, he still isn't sure what caused this amazingly real experience, but it has made him more open-minded to things where most people would automatically assume disbelief. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please tell somebody about it who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do, and tell them where they can listen to the show so they can tune in next weekend. If you missed any part of tonight's show, or if you'd like to hear it again, you can subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app by searching for Weird Darkness. By doing that, you'll get a copy of tonight's show plus daily podcast episodes that come out seven days per week. Visit WeirdDarkness.com and you can follow me on social media. Drop me an email, send me your own true paranormal story, listen to other podcasts that I host, and more. All stories used tonight are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes, which I have already posted at WeirdDarkness.com. Creepy Encounters with Real Doppelgangers was written by Nathan Gibson. Surviving Out-of-Body Experiences is by Audrey Webster. And A Famous Case of Frightening Entities is by Brent Swanser. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And a final thought. Let people do what they need to do to make them happy. Mind your own business and do what you need to do to make you happy. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.
Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. As a deep-sea ecologist, I often find myself engaging with cryptozoology and other fringe science. That shouldn't be surprising. After all, we actually did find the giant squid and then the even larger colossal squid. Even though almost all infamous cryptids are, at best, the product of mythology, I enjoy getting to the meat of the matter, seeking out the origins of these stories and trying to understand how they emerge and persist. And among the most compelling cryptid in the sea is Stellar's sea ape. In the year 1740, after a two-year overland journey from Moscow to Okhotsk, the naturalist George William Stellar boarded the St. Peter and joined Captain Vitus Bering on the Great Northern Expedition. This expedition would define Europe's relationship to the Northern Pacific for the next three centuries. It marked the European discovery of Alaska expanded the Russian Empire and put to rest legends of a Northeast Passage. During the expedition, Stellar identified and described dozens of new species. It's hard to argue that he discovered them as the Arctic Pacific had already been populated by humans for thousands of years, including the now extinct Stellar's sea cow, the threatened Stellar's eider, the threatened Stellar's sea eagle, and the near-threatened Stellar's sea lion. Modern naturalists sometimes joke that it's bad luck to be named for Stellar, though the Stellar's J seems to be doing fine. Stellar also identified a curious and enduring cryptid, Stellar's sea ape, which he describes in the book The Beasts of the Sea. The animal was about two L's, that's about six feet long. The head was like a dog's head, the ears pointed and erect, and on the upper and lower lips on both sides whiskers hung down. The body was longish, round and fat. The skin was covered thickly with hair, gray on the back, reddish-white on the belly, but in the water it seemed to be all red and cow-colored. He dubbed it Simnia marina denica, after a similar description from a 16th century document. Simnia marina hasn't had any notable sightings since Stellar's account, but due largely to his stellar reputation as a naturalist, the sea ape continues to endure in the annals of cryptozoology. Though not nearly as popular as Loch Ness Monsters or Sasquatles, a prominent Bigfoot researcher informed me that this is the proper plural of Sasquatch, it does periodically appear on cryptozoology websites, either left unidentified or to be explained away as a mangy northern fur seal, a curious otter, or Stellar's own sea cow. All these explanations tend to be unsatisfying and not particularly compelling. Stellar's notes indicate that he spent several hours in close proximity to the sea ape, watching it feed and play around the boat. He even attempted twice to shoot it. Cryptozoologists point to this extended account to argue that it's unlikely that Stellar would so badly misidentify a species that he himself described. And I tend to agree. In order to unravel the mystery of Stellar's sea ape, we need to turn not to biology and ecology, but rather history, in particular the history of Vitus Bering, George Stellar, and the ill-fated voyage of St. Peter. Though a public success, the Great Northern Expedition was a brutal, gruesome slog through the uncharted North Pacific. Stellar missed the departure in 1738, which prompted his overland journey to Okhotsk to meet the ship two years later. 
Originally planning to join him for part of the journey, Stellar's wife decided a two-year schlep across Siberia was not for her. She stayed behind in Moscow. Bering, by all accounts, was not particularly inclined to humor the naturalist. During the entire expedition, Stellar was permitted ashore just once, for ten hours, while St. Peter was resupplied. Many of Stellar's species descriptions came from that short jaunt. It would likely be the last enjoyable moment for Stellar during the expedition. Though Stellar was spared, the St. Peter crew and officers were plagued with scurvy. Bering was so sick that he barely left his stateroom. Stellar's opportunities for further expeditions ashore vanished. A month and a half later, after his one trip ashore, on August 10, 1741, somewhere south of Kodiak Island, Stellar pulled out his notebook and described his sea ape. Three months later, facing heavy storms, the St. Peter wrecked on the shore of Bering Island. Bering died of scurvy on December 8, and as the winters pressed in, the wrecked ship itself was destroyed. The crew held out through the winter, though another 28 died. On Bering Island, they discovered, then consumed, the ill-fated Stellar's sea cow, a massive Arctic dugong, think gigantic manatee. Less than 30 years after its discovery, Stellar's sea cow would be hunted to extinction. The first modern marine mammal to go extinct thanks to human intervention. As the weather improved, the surviving crew cobbled together a tiny vessel from St. Peter's remains and set off to continue the expedition. They named their new ship the Bering, likely not as a compliment. During the eight months they spent stranded on Bering Island, Stellar composed De Bastillus Marinus, a popular account of the animals they encountered on the voyage. This document would ultimately be published after his death. The sea ape did not appear in any of Stellar's official reports. Stellar remained in the high Arctic for another two years, studying the Kamchatka Peninsula before being recalled to St. Petersburg. He died en route in November 1746. His notes, documents, and manuscripts reached the Academy in St. Petersburg and were published posthumously, and the sea ape would live on. What was the sea ape? The secret lies in the breadcrumbs left through Stellar's notes. His description of the ambling creature made only three months before the voyage's catastrophic end is not dissimilar from his descriptions of the captain he despised. The whiskers that hung down the sea ape's face bear a striking likeness to the heavy chops favored by Bering. Perhaps desperate to return to land, Stellar even fantasized about taking a few shots at the source of his suffering. Its absence from his official report suggests that Stellar himself didn't take the sea ape seriously. Stranded for months on a frozen island, did a bitter Stellar choose to immortalize his hatred for the captain in popular lore? The most compelling evidence for his hypothesis lies in the name Stellar gave his sea ape. He didn't name it Simnia Marina, literally sea ape, but Simnia Marina Danica, the Danish sea ape. There was only one Dane aboard St. Peter, its captain, Vitus Bering. There is a tendency to forget when studying natural history, especially of the early days of exploration, that these great scientific endeavors were conducted by people. Relationships have as much, if not more, impact on the success or failure of a voyage than scientific expertise. As Stellar's great expedition into the uncharted Arctic descended into an ice-filled slog, he turned to humor to lash out at the man he blamed for their misfortune. At the time, he couldn't have known that things were only going to get worse, or that the story of his sea ape would endure. This next story is from weirdo family member Jamie Tyroller. Your recent story about Stull Cemetery reminds me of my experience with the cemetery and the old church. I was a freshman at the University of Kansas in the spring of 1978 and went there with some friends on the spring equinox. According to news reports, there were about 150 people there around midnight and nothing seemed to happen. 
When driving back to campus, we decided to stop and look around an abandoned fraternity house, a concrete monstrosity that probably wasn't used for very long. The building on 9th Street has since been demolished, but as we were walking around this abandoned building for about 10 minutes or so, a small pebble flew across the main room on the first floor. I was in the room with one friend and we barely paid attention to it, thinking it might have been something that just fell off the ceiling or wall, except for the angle that the pebble bounced on the floor. The others were walking around upstairs. After a few minutes, another small pebble flew into the room. My friend, who was also downstairs with me, looked out a large opening that was probably large windows at one time. He didn't see anybody outside and came back in. We both denied throwing anything. After a few minutes, another pebble came into the room. The next pebble was a little larger and hit closer to my friend than the previous pebbles. It was thrown, or however it was put into motion, slightly faster than the previous ones. The two people who were upstairs came back downstairs and we asked if they knew anything about the flying pebbles and a small rock flew across the room faster than the last rock shortly after they both denied having anything to do with these stones being thrown. The small stones started getting slightly larger and faster before we got out of there. We didn't really talk about our experiences, but I don't know if this had anything to do with going to Stull during the time when Satan was supposed to appear or if this abandoned fraternity house was haunted on its own, but I don't think any of us went back. I know I didn't. Next, weirdo family member Daniel Hagen shares how he once explored some woods on his bike and ended up pedaling for his life to escape paranormal beasts that appeared from nowhere. Plus, digging in their backyard, two brothers find what appear to be small human heads carved of stone, but the curious find turns creepy once they bring the heads into the house, resurrecting sightings of a wolf-like creature not seen in almost 70 years. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises, but those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your close-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you, so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. This next story comes from weirdo family member Daniel Hagen. Here's the story in his own words. This story took place during the summer of 1981. I was 12 years old. 
I was camping with my family at a place called Canoe River Campground in Mansfield, Massachusetts. The location of the campground is right on the edge of the Hockamock Swamp Bridgewater Triangle. As was the custom on any sunny day, I took my red BMX bike and went looking for something to do. After cruising by the rec room and seeing that it was filled with teenagers, I decided I would explore one of the small brooks that feed into Mill Pond. There was a path that followed the brook part of the way, which I had stopped at last time. This time I decided I wanted to go further upstream and see what was there. So I dropped down into the brook and rode deeper into the woods. The brook was shallow and easy to navigate. As I made my way down the brook, I stopped and explored any clearing or path I found. I estimated I'd ridden for about 30 or 40 minutes when I came upon a path that led away from the brook and into the woods. Without hesitation, I rode onto the path and followed it. I was only on the path for maybe five minutes when I spilled out into a clearing, and that is when I came upon the abandoned house. It was an old, dilapidated farmhouse with a stone foundation. It was pretty run down and kind of creepy, but it was a bright, sunny summer morning. I jumped off my bike and started to explore the place. I moved through the first floor, old stove, cabinets, and then I walked up the rickety old stairs to the second floor and looked in all the bedrooms. I eventually found my way down into the basement, which led to what looked like an old garage. Now, when I tell you the place was abandoned, it was, in no doubt. The house was an absolute wreck. Walls crumbling, windows smashed out, the only living things around were run-of-the-mill wildlife. The place was empty. Now, the garage was filled with old bottles of every description, and being a bored 12-year-old, I decided that it'd be a good idea to smash bottles off the stone foundation. So I collected up bottles and proceeded to go around the house and smash bottles on every part of it. Like I said, it was an early summer morning. Sun out, insects, and birds doing their thing. I was having a blast. When suddenly, everything changed. I didn't notice right away as I was busy smashing bottles, but when I ran out of bottles and was heading back to get more, I suddenly got a strange feeling, like I was being watched. I froze, and that is when I noticed that things had gotten quiet. I then heard the scraping of chains on the ground. A cold chill ran up my spine and I started to feel very scared. I finally got up the courage to move and I turned toward the opening of the garage and that is when I saw two of the meanest, evilest dogs you ever saw. They weren't there five minutes ago. Impossible. I just came from there. Well, after looking at these two demon dogs for what seemed like an hour, I regained my composure and jumped on my bike and got the bleep out of there. I know it sounds like the wild imagination of a 12-year-old boy, but I know what I saw. Wolf at Large in Allendale was the headline of the Hexham Current on the 10th of December, 1904. The Current reported that in the last three weeks, farmers around the village of Allendale were stabling their animals at night as loss of livestock had become a serious concern. One farmer had found two of his sheep killed, one with its bowels hanging out. The head and horns were all that remained of another animal many of the unfortunate livestock had been bitten around the neck and legs, suggesting an attack by a wolf. It was suggested that the perpetrator was a gray wolf that had escaped from its owner, Captain Bain of Shotley Bridge. However, Shotley Bridge Police Station had recorded Captain Bain's wolf as being only four and a half months old, not much of a danger to men or livestock. Sightings of the beast began to filter through the community. A report of an imposing-looking wolf lurking around behind Allen Head School brought a hunting party of 150 residents to the scene, some armed with guns. A search of the area found only a spot within a large drain where it was thought the beast may have slept. The Hexham Current reported on the 17th December that on the previous Wednesday, the wolf had committed great slaughter of a flock of sheep. 
the wolf had been tracked by a 100-strong hunting party but could not be driven towards the guns of the group. The following day, another hunting party, 200 strong, half of whom were armed with guns again attempted to track the wolf, but the search proved hopeless. Further sightings, sometimes conflicting, were reported over the next several days, describing the beast as black and tan or dun-colored. The community became unsettled. Lanterns were kept burning overnight in an attempt to ward the wolf away, and the Hexham Wolf Committee was founded to organize efforts to track down the beast, offering rewards to prospective wolf trackers. Throughout the winter, the hunt for the Allendale wolf continued. Renowned tracking dogs, the Hayden Hounds, were put on the trail, but not even the prized bloodhound of the group, Monarch, could find its quarry. Charles Ford, who recorded the case in his book, Low, commented, The wise dog was put on what was supposed to be the trail of the wolf, but if there weren't any wolf, who can blame a celebrated bloodhound for not smelling something that wasn't? The Wolf Committee persevered and hired Mr. W. Brittick, a skilled Indian game hunter. Mr. Brittick was interviewed by the Newcastle Evening Chronicle, stating that he would find the Allendale wolf on scientific lines. Despite his experience and scientific pretensions, Brittick was unable to track down the animal. Despite the lack of success in tracking down their wolf, the locals adopted the continuing search as part of their folklore. Hunt days soon took on a sense of occasion, complete with fancy dress and sing-songs. Throughout December and over Christmas, the search continued. The wolf was witnessed jumping over a high wall to escape two men, and the following day it was seen attacking a black-faced ewe. One afternoon in late December, the wolf was encountered by a group of women and children whose screams startled and scared the wolf away. In 1905, a corpse of a wolf was found on a railway track in Combington, Cumbria, some 30 miles west of Hexham. The Hexham Current on the 7th of January reported that the corpse was not that of the Wolf of Allendale, and the Wolf Committee claimed the beast was still at large. It was suggested that there were perhaps an entire family of predators living in the Allendale woods, which does offer an explanation as to why there had been differing descriptions of the animal. By the end of January 1905, reports of the wolf began to wane, culminating with a succinct report of a wolf sighted with a snare attached to its leg. Eventually, the sightings and livestock killings ceased altogether little or nothing was heard of the Wolf of Allendale until 1972. At the Robson family home in Hexham, only 10 minutes walk away from where the legendary Wolf of Allendale had roamed the woods, the two young Robson brothers dug up two small carved stone heads whilst they were tending the garden. Several nights after the discovery of the stone heads, neighbor Ellen Dodd and her daughter were sitting up late one evening when both of them witnessed a half-man, half-beast entering the bedroom. The pair screamed in terror, but the creature seemed indifferent to them and simply left the room, heard to be padding down the stairs as if on its hind legs. Later on, the front door was found open. It has been thought that the creature had been in search of something and had left the house to continue searching elsewhere. Interest in the local legend of the Wolf of Allendale was rekindled by this event, and the stone heads became associated with the possible reappearance of the wolf. The two stone heads, each about the size of an orange, were thought to be Celtic in origin, and collector Dr. Anne Ross took possession of the heads as she had several other stone heads in her collection and wished to compare them to the Hexham pair. A few nights after taking possession of the heads, Dr. Ross awoke at 2 a.m. one morning feeling cold and frightened. Looking up, she saw a strange creature standing in her bedroom doorway. Quote, it was about six feet high, slightly stooping, and it was black against the white door, and it was half animal and half man. The upper part I would have said was a wolf, and the lower part was human, and I would have again said that it was covered with a kind of black, very dark fur. It went out, and I just saw it clearly, and then it disappeared and something made me run after it, a thing I would not normally have done, but I felt compelled to run after it. 
I got out of bed and I ran and I could hear it going down the stairs. Then it disappeared towards the back of the house. Living and working in Southampton, Dr. Ross knew nothing of the Wolf of Allendale legend and the association of the Hexham Heads with the possible return of the wolf, and she attributed the experience to a nightmare. Dr. Ross came home with her archaeologist husband, Richard Feacham, one day, only to find their teenage daughter, Bernice, in a distressed state. Bernice explained that she had used her key to unlock the front door and entered the house that afternoon to witness a large black shape rushing down the stairs. Halfway downstairs, the creature vaulted the banister, landing with a soft, heavy thud like a large animal with padded feet. Believing the presence of the stone heads to be responsible for these events, Dr. Ross passed on her whole collection of stone heads, along with the Hexham pair, to other collectors. The Hexham heads found their way to the British Museum for public display, though they were soon removed from display and mothballed amid reports of unsettling events associated with the heads. There have been claims that the Hexham heads were not Celtic in origin and had simply been carved as toys by the previous occupants of the Robson family home only 20 years previously and had subsequently become lost in the garden. It has also been said that the heads were examined by the universities of Newcastle and Southampton for dating. For now, the current whereabouts of the Hexham heads remain unknown. Despite this, the legend of the Hexham Heads and its association with the Wolf of Allendale has become a cornerstone of the local folklore of the area. When Weird Darkness returns, in 1886 Chicago, one of the nation's very first serial killers would build a sadistic chamber of horrors to live out his most demented fantasies. When Salem Roanoke took a job near his family's new home as a hired hand in the Texas Hill Country, he anticipated learning the rancher's trade, but a series of strange events, shocking murders, and unholy revelations divert him down another path. This terrifying trajectory puts him directly into the middle of a struggle between monsters, magic, and men. Armed and backed by a militia of ranchers, Salem attempts to combat the creeping tide of evil that threatens to engulf his new home and destroy the people most important to him. Will Salem manage to save his home, or have his actions condemn everyone he hopes to save? The Witch Trials, A Summer of Wolves and Season of the Witch by S. R. Roanoke. Available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions. Look for The Witch Trials by S. R. Roanoke on Amazon or find it on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. There are some creepy places in this world that go beyond merely haunted, being not only supposedly infested by ghosts, but also imbued with a history of pain, woe, strife, and death, indeed pure evil. One such place exists in the city of Chicago, Illinois, in the United States. It was here that one of the nation's very first serial killers would build a sadistic chamber of horrors to live out his most demented fantasies, and the murder castle has remained a dark mark on the city's history and haunted with both real ghosts and its horrific past. In 1886, a man named Henry Howard Holmes came to the city of Chicago, Illinois, and began a humble job working at a corner drugstore owned by an Elizabeth S. Holton, and by all accounts he was an intelligent, hard-working and very charming man who before long had made quick friends with everyone in the area. He also seemed to be moving up in the world, eventually buying the store and becoming owner. What many people did not know was that the man they knew as H. H. Holmes was not who they thought he was, 
and that he was to begin a reign of terror that would shock the city and indeed the nation. What most people did not know back then was that Holmes had begun life as Herman Webster Mudgett, born in 1861 in New Hampshire. He also had a rather turbulent past, moving from school to school before finally settling at the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery, during which time he had worked at a medical lab and began his first steps on the road to a criminal career by using cadavers to defraud insurance companies. Also during his university days, he was married, had a son, and got separated, and after graduating, he began the first of his many jumps around the country, settling in Moores Forks, New York, where his history would begin to take on a tint of the sinister. While living in New York, he was suspected of having something to do with the mysterious disappearance of a boy he had last been seen with, and although he was never charged with any crime and denied any wrongdoing, he rather suspiciously moved on to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where he took up work as a pharmacist at a drugstore. Here, too, there would be suspicions aimed his way when a young boy overdosed and died from taking medication from the store. Once again, Holmes was not prosecuted, but he once again skipped town right after, this time finding his way to Chicago, where he changed his name and planned to start a new identity. This is where we come back to Holmes and his new life, where everyone was blissfully unaware of any of his shady past and where he seemed to be successful and well-liked. Yet it was during this time he would get up to his old manipulative ways, marrying another woman, Myrta Belknap, while still technically married to his previous wife, although they soon separated as well. Despite this, no one had a clue what he was up to, and he was still ever the charming, successful businessman. He was so successful, in fact, that in 1887, in the years leading up to the 1893 Chicago World Fair, he bought a lot across the street from the drugstore and began the construction of a massive three-story building that he planned to turn into a hotel. The construction would prove to be unorthodox, to say the least, with homes changing architects, contractors, and workers frequently. But this wasn't quite strange enough to gather any suspicions at the time. When the hotel was completed in 1891, he began hiring employees, and oddly enough, he demanded that they have life insurance and additionally that they make him the beneficiary. Strange, but again not weird enough to arouse any suspicion at the time. The World Fair would come and go, and unfortunately the hotel portion of the building seems to have never been opened due to various disputes over payment with the various contractors and architects who had worked on it, but the store's front section on the first floor proved to be a success. Holmes was still up to his ways, marrying yet another woman, Georgiana Yoke, in the meantime, as well as allegedly having numerous mistresses, mostly employees, but there was no reason yet to think that he was anything other than another rich, charming playboy. No one knew that during the World Fair, Holmes had been hard at work completing a string of insurance scams all over the country with an accomplice by the name of Benjamin Pitizel, and there was no particular suspicion raised when he suddenly left Chicago to go off and pull off more scams. Not all of these schemes were successful, and Holmes once ended up in jail for a scam and on another occasion he tried to scam an insurance company by faking his own death only for it to fail when red flags were raised. Not long after this, Holmes kept at his faked death scam, this time turning to his accomplice, Pedizel, and having him fake his own death so that they could collect the insurance money, the same plan he had unsuccessfully tried before with himself. It is unclear just what part of the faked of a fake death Holmes didn't understand, but he ended up making Pedizel just plain dead after which he collected the money and skipped town. Police wanted Holmes for an outstanding warrant for fraud, but also began to suspect Holmes of foul play when they learned of the scam that he had planned, coupled with Pitizel's disappearance, and they eventually tracked him down in Boston with the help of information provided by a disgruntled former accomplice of Holmes. He was arrested November 17, 1894, and this would be the beginning of the end for Holmes 
and the start of a show of horrors the likes of which the country had never seen. As they dug deeper into the case, the investigation discovered that not only had Pitizel been murdered in cold blood, but that three of his five children who had last been seen with Holmes had also been killed and buried in the cellar of a house Holmes had been renting. Holmes was now a murder suspect, and he was also increasingly linked to more and more mysterious disappearances, namely a number of women who had worked at his hotel. However, it was when they began searching his hotel's premises that the real horror show began. He was immediately found to be a rather odd and unsettling place, with doors and stairways that led to nowhere, doors that opened onto brick walls or only opened one way, a complicated labyrinthine floor layout that seemed almost designed to confuse people, and various trap doors, secret doors, peepholes, and anomalous holes that would later be found to have been used to insert hoses for pumping poisonous gas. It was also found that several of the rooms were soundproofed, had been rigged with alarms, and held chutes leading to the basement as well. These baffling and hazy clues would all become very clear and draw sharply into focus when police searched the murky depths of the hotel basement. One of the first things they discovered down there in those dark depths was a pile of animal and human bones, which would later be shown to have come from children. More macabre discoveries followed, such as other bone fragments, an acid vat presumably for dissolving human remains, chemicals for just that purpose, and a large stove for cremation found to have a pile of ashes containing a woman's gold chain, a watch, and some metal buttons. There was also a dissecting table with bloodied women's clothing lying atop it, as well as various tools for dissection. According to some accounts, it was even claimed that there were various horrific torture devices like something out of a medieval dungeon scattered about. For all appearances, this was a veritable murderer's playground, and police began to suspect what he had been up to. It was thought that Holmes had rigged the rooms with alarms that sounded in his own room and peepholes so that he could secretly watch guests and keep an eye on their movements, and the secret doors would have allowed him to move about unseen. He could then administer gas into their rooms to knock them out when his victims were least expecting it, after which he would drop them down a chute to the basement where he would torture them, kill them, chop them up, and then dissolve or burn any remains. He even also seemed to have intentionally designed the hotel to be confusing, along with its non-intuitive layout, one-way doors, and stairways to nowhere in order to thwart any effort to escape. Although the hotel seems to have never actually opened for business, it was suspected that he still had some guests from time to time, and that he had numerous mistresses stay here as well, although how many he may have killed in his death trap was unknown. In the end, for all of this, there were found no full human bodies, and the bones could have come from anywhere. After all, Holmes had worked with cadavers before, so they may have been from people who were already deceased. Despite all of the gruesome and disturbing evidence on hand, there was nothing concrete to prove that Holmes had actually murdered anyone there, and so he was not charged with anything concerning the hotel, which was now widely becoming known as the Murder Castle by sensationalized news reports. Additionally, Holmes insisted that he was innocent and had done nothing wrong. Eventually, after a very highly publicized and bizarre trial, Holmes would only officially be found guilty of the murder of Benjamin Pitizel but he was highly implicated in the murder of Pitizel's children as well. In the wake of his murder conviction, Holmes underwent a sinister change, going from proclaiming his innocence to a full confession of having carried out 27 additional murders, as well as six attempted murders. He also began to make claims that he was under the influence of satanic forces, and that he was at times even fully possessed by the devil. One of his most famous quotes while incarcerated was, I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer no more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. I was born with the evil one standing as my sponsor beside the bed where I was ushered into the world, 
and he has been with me since. All of this added to the macabre allure of the case, which was splashed everywhere in the news, drawing intense interest from all over. These sensational news stories were often over-exaggerated, adding grim details or inflating the death toll, with some pulp tabloid-style newspapers claiming that the monstrous homes had slaughtered up to 200 people. But no matter what the real number was, he was only convicted of one, the murder of Pitazel. For this murder, he would be sentenced to death and executed by hanging May 7, 1896, in a spectacle that included a botched execution that led to Holmes dangling about the rope for 20 minutes before finally dying and ending his reign of terror. Oddly, Holmes had requested that his body be encased in a huge slab of concrete in order to prevent grave robbers from stealing it, and this was done in accordance with his wishes. In the aftermath of Holmes' death, there began a string of mysterious accidents and deaths involving people and places who had been associated with him or who had helped put him behind bars. The first strange incident occurred not long after Holmes was dead, when a coroner who had testified against him suddenly developed serious blood poisoning for no reason and died. Next was a mysterious explosion and fire that completely razed the hotel to the ground in 1895. After this, other deaths followed in quick succession, including another coroner and the judge who had sentenced Holmes to death, who both fell down with mysterious illnesses, as well as the prison warden, from suicide. Then there were the deaths of the father of one of Holmes' alleged victims, a priest who had read him his last rites, and a jury foreman from the trial who died in a freak accident when electrical wires fell down on him. All of this quickly convinced people that Holmes had left some dark curse behind. The curse continued when one of the offices of the insurance company that had foiled his fake death plot burned to the ground. There were also more strange deaths in later years. The man who had pointed authorities in Holmes' direction, who'd been pardoned for providing the information, was shot and killed in a violent shootout with police in Chicago in 1909. Then there was the suicide of the former caretaker of the hotel, who killed himself in 1914 after claiming that he'd been haunted with constant, strange hallucinations. One of the detectives who helped track Holmes down also fell seriously ill, although he survived. Whether any of this had anything to do with a supernatural curse or not is unknown, but it is all very creepy nonetheless. Other strange mysteries hover about Holmes and his murder castle as well. Although the building was destroyed in a fire, people claimed that at night there could be heard ghostly screams and moans coming from the charred plot, and that shadowy figures could be seen stalking about in the darkness. Animals were also said to avoid it like the plague, with dogs refusing to go anywhere near it. Even when a post office was built there in 1938, the hauntings didn't stop, and the building is said to be incredibly haunted to this day. Postal workers have described all manner of paranormal phenomena occurring here, such as anomalous noises, moving objects, roving cold spots, shadowy apparitions, and even the ghost of Holmes himself, and this is all experienced the most in the basement, which is a surviving remnant of the original hotel. Besides the curse and hauntings, there have also been conspiracy theories attached to the story of Holmes. It was long believed that he had never even died at all, and that the body they buried that day was not his, his final masterpiece of a scam. This conspiracy was so rampant and pervasive that in 2017 his grave was actually exhumed to see if there was any truth to it. Within the immense two-ton chunk of concrete, the remains and even his clothes were found to be remarkably intact and well-preserved, and the body would be conclusively identified as that of Holmes, ending the conspiracy theory. With the dark and sinister infusing it all, it's understandable why the grotesque story has gained so much attention and has produced so many spooky accounts. The colorful, morbid tale of Henry Howard Holmes has achieved an almost legendary status, but it is also so peppered with exaggerations and unknowns that it's hard to know sometimes 
where the truth of the man ends and the myth begins. Very little is known of the man himself, and even his deeds have been played up for maximum creepiness. We don't even know how many people he really killed. With all the stories of hauntings and curses, it all gets even further pushed into the murky realm of strange mysteries and the unknown, where it's hard to really know what to make of any of it. Nevertheless, it is certainly a breathtaking tale of horror and serial killers from a time when that wasn't even a common phrase in America, and it will remain indelibly imprinted upon history as a glimpse into pure evil.